from the bottom. Okay. Welcome all to the special session on mathematical methods and techniques in signal processing. So this is the first time we are having a, a special session which is going live in air. There were a bit of technical difficulties here with the team here on ground. So uh, you know we are slightly delayed, but I think uh, we can get started now. So please let me know if everyone is able to listen to my. Um, uh you know listen to my talk here and then if you have you can post questions which will be collected live by the tas uh, and and then we can begin with this so i think uh, i would like to introduce the tas here I, i'll just uh, briefly uh, say something here and you can see their faces who they are um, so this is um, chaitanya kumar who is uh, who's, who's a ta here can you see him i think this is something which this is the second scene okay so this is a uh, chaitanya kumar you can sit down you can show your face so he's, he's one of the tas who is handling this uh, course and um, uh, he's a senior phd student then uh, we have priya natkarni so priya is another ta who is handling this course uh, and then she's also a phd student here with iisc then we have amrita machi reddy so she's uh, also a phd student who is handling the uh, this course as a ta so um, welcome all the students shaunak is he here is not yeah so the shaunak roy who is not in here but i think we can go we can get started so so the purpose of this special session is uh, basically to have a little more of interactive uh, feedback with students i mean you have done at least eight rounds of assignments and the ninth assignment is already given and you might be wondering who is behind the scenes so i think we are all as a part of the team uh, i am shain shrinivas agarani i am the faculty i am handling this and together with myself and my team of four tas we are uh, <clears throat> conducting this Uh, mooc course so feel free completely um, to ask questions uh, welcome all of you to this special session uh, and make use of this um, uh, special session to ask questions whatever you have get those clarified and if it requires any detailed calculations etc i can always um, take it back and we can um, we can answer your questions um, by email but if you have any general questions discussions difficulties whatever you face Uh, you can basically ask uh, the questions, and we'll be happy to take questions. Can everyone uh, see this link? Are you all uh, able to see the link? So if you say yes, I think <coughs> we can figure out if uh, you're comfortable. Amrita, do we have any questions? So, how many of uh, how many students are lying uh, of lying? Thank you. 
Okay, it's fine. It will be very informal. It's, it's okay. Right now there are two people. The Rohit and then uh, Vijay Kant. What about Af Afsal? Afsal. Afsal also should be there. I'm not sure if he has seen this. Okay. So what is a chirp? Direct transform and what are its applications? Okay. What is a chirp? Z transform, it's chirp transform and what are its applications? So I think um, it is basically, I, I, um, um, you know, the chirp transform is, is, is has its applications in uh, in speech processing and also in, in, um, in mainly in speech processing because the ear drum, you know, you can think about, it's a logarithmic, basically spacing of the frequencies, right? So um, if you, this is basically uh, um, akin to, if you, if you think about the tympanum, the eardrum, and you, you open up the, the eardrum, and if you can observe the frequencies, it is basically a logarithmic spacing of the frequencies. And the chirp Z exactly does that. So um, basically it is logarithmic, it, 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 uh, it, it, uh, it, it's a transformation which places a logarithmic emphasis over these frequencies. And, um, and, and that is basically attuned to the hearing in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the acoustic, uh, from the acoustic signal processing perspective, this transformation can be used to basically resonate to what is done similar to the human ear. So, hope that uh, answers your question. And the details of how the, the mathematical specifications of transformation, you can refer to Oppenheim Schaeffer's book. And uh, there is a link to the exact definition of the transformation. But this is essentially what the chip transformation does. Linearly modulated uh, or exponentially. In, in the log domain, it is linearly modulated. So. So this question was from Sita Singh, right? Okay. Okay, great. So, which part of uh, which? Where, where are you from, Sita? Which part of India or the world? We don't know here. So, we we can introduce yourself. Which uh, part of uh, the world you are from, or which part of India you are from? Which college or university? Uh, so that it gives us, it it makes us uh, much more interactive. It is just like a radio image, like uh, you know, we, are, we are just getting your your comments here on the web, from through the web, and you know, I'm just answering your questions. I would like to know your background as well. So, so feel free. Okay, now it's 31 viewers. Okay, great. So, so Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh. And the TS, you can also feel free to um, inter, inter, in, you know, interrupt in the middle, and you can we can make it a really informal uh, set of discussions. So feel completely at free. Okay. Questions, please. So make use of this time. We will have more of these. 
but I want you to make use of this special session. We'll ask questions from uh, the course, and if you have any questions to the TAs, you're most welcome to ask. Um, you know, feel completely free. He's working. Working. Working professional. Okay. There's a question by Shivakumar. Okay. Say uh, that. Can you? What is the best? Suit? So there's a question from Shivakumar. Mm -hmm. It says, uh, he asks, uh, what is the best suitable signal processing techniques for uh, fault diagnosis of rotating machinery? Fault diagnosis of rotating machinery. So, um, a good question. Um, fault tolerance and I mean, normally defects, if you think about it, they appear as artifacts in, in, in some way. And the rotatory <coughs> machinery, I mean, uh, even if it is rotating, you can also always uh, unfurl it in, in, in the form of a linear uh, 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 signal, right? I mean, though it is rotating, rotating target, the the signature it 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 it, it brings in as it goes through a linear. You, you can have a linear component there, right? I mean, if you fix a point, let this be a rotating point, and let a rotating machine as it goes through circum through the circumference, it will translate itself linearly over time. So I suggest that you could use uh, wavelets basically to figure out any artifacts, etc. In the in the in the linear uh, as as it as as it sees a linear spread. Another way is to modify via possibly circular wavelets. This is, is, is an idea that I have uh, that I can think about. So I hope this answers your questions. Because any fault is basically an aberration or a high frequency component. And I think wavelet can uh, hopefully do that. Or you can even take the as an initial step, you can just do a fast Fourier transform. Just observe the high frequency side of this uh, 50, and then you may see something. And with the rotatory parts, mainly what you will see is the, you will see this periodic motion. There is a periodicity in the signal, right? And the periodicity will reflect into the spectrum, which is you have to look at the baseband spectrum, and from there arrive at what is the right way, right? There are also um, uh, the red on transforms and some of these other things, which 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 make use of radial symmetry. So I, I first I would try the FFT first, figure out if I can some do something. Then I will do the wavelet, um, and then if uh, if there's radial symmetry in the parts, etc., you, you might even think about red on red on transform, and post that you may do a wavelet decomposition to figure out if there is anything. So you may have a mixture of two two transformations. So adding to what Professor said, uh, in fact I did some study on this uh, fault detection of some of the machinery. Okay. So uh, the way they do it is, uh, as Professor mentioned, we look at the periodic signals and look at the uh, res responses at the harmonic frequencies. Okay. So and see if there is uh, any deviation in the response in those harmonic frequencies when the uh, desired or uh, uh, non faulty session. And that is one way. So it seems like a Fourier transform should work. Should work. Yeah. But I suggest you to experiment. Yeah. Suggest to you to experiment if you. Think the F50 doesn't work, then go through sophisticated transformations as in, as and when required. But the geometry of your device, everything really accounts for what it what it has to be done, what needs to be done. So there's a question from Abzal. Okay, uh, he says uh, I'd like to know about sampling. Any specific? Uh, I would like to know about sampling. Uh, you've asked me a very broad question, Afzal. Not just a brief. Just a brief clarification. Okay. So here is the goal of sampling. I mean, you know, um, I'll, I'll give you a historic perspective. And for those of you who are um, uh, who have logged in live, right? I think it's a history history session. So the uh, the idea of sampling uh, is very important because when you think about an analog signal. Uh, it, it it has a lot of information, right? Analog signal, you really require infinite precision to store the analog uh, signal and process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In practice, we need to get to discrete time because we deal with finite precision, right? Even if you think about your computer and a sophisticated computer, you are a 64-bit machine, which is still fixed point, right? You're really not floating point. You have a very a high resolution, which means you can access a 2 power minus 64. Now, an analog signal is basically 
made discrete time via the act of sampling. So basically, if I have an analog signal like this, right, I have to sample at greater than twice the maximum frequency contained in the signal and this is basically the sampling rate and this is precisely greater than because if it is equal then if you're sampling at zero points for example if you have a sine wave like this right if you sample at exactly this phase then you can you'll sample here you, you you may sample here you may sample here you may sample at the zero crossings this is not there uh, So if it is equality, then there is a trouble, as you can see through this picture here. So therefore, we strictly restrict it to be greater than two times the maximum frequency. Basically, you have a pulse that you sample. You have a signal here, continuous time signal. You sample at certain rate fs, which is more than twice the maximum frequency contained in the signal. And this is how one can think about it. I mean, this small uh, this this pulse is very very narrow and you can say as uh, you know it, it, it the time is really very very small and you can think treat this almost as an impulse right i'm just going to put your samples here so on and so forth right so these are your samples that you're uh, at these points right you, you know you're capturing this you're capturing this capturing this capturing this so on and so forth to the rest of the signal right and now these samples can be quantized right can be quantized and you can store it or you can process it and you can do whatever you want so basically you have taken a continuous time uh, signal and then you are sampling and then you get it's like a switch i think i'll have to put this as a switch as well and then you get discrete time samples. This is the idea of sampling. And then from this, these discrete time samples, I should be able to reconstruct continuous time as well back. And that you can do so using ideal uh, low pass filters, which are Nyquist filters. So this is the whole idea of sampling. So as you can see now, when you have these discrete samples, you can process it on your computer. You can do whatever you want on a, on a computing device. Uh, and and then you can filter it out. You can filter the noise. Many sophisticated techniques can be handled using uh, discrete time signal processing. So that's the whole idea why you need to sample. And this is this was a question people raised in the 1940s during World War because they wanted to do this. Is how the field actually evolved. I hope this gives you a clarification about what sampling is about. So next there is uh, uh... is he is he okay with it? Does he have any more questions? Afzal, are you okay? So, uh, the next question is by uh, Irene Sen Gupta. Hope I pronounce it correctly. Irene uh, uh, Sen Gupta. Okay. So, in digital speech processing, what are the best uh, signal processing methods to separate signal from noise? Uh, is there any method that identifies the different uh, phonetics? Okay, in digital speech processing, what are the best things? So the, the, most of the digital uh, speech processing techniques have been through statistical methods. And to separate signal from noise, you are basically have to figure out, uh, uh, basically noise is, again, what kind of noise, right? Is it uh, high frequency noise or is it low frequency noise? So you can do a capstrum, right? You can take the log of the transformation, of, of the transformation, you do a capstrum transformation. Uh, basically, basically, you have a signal, uh, plus noise, you take um, in the logarithm of this uh, thing, right? And then you can um, you, you can filter them out, and or you can even treat adaptive. You can use adaptive signal processing techniques. Basically, you remove the correlations uh, present in the noise, and then that la that will land up with a white noise. And a white noise you cannot do better than better than that. You, you have to live with white noise. So the whole idea about uh, most of these uh, signal processing techniques is to basically uh, reduce any correlated noise to a white noise and that you can do using whitening filters etc and post uh, uh, this whitening process you have to leave that noise and you can suppress if you know certain harmonics are bad 
because speech is basically low frequency signal so if you know there's a, the certain properties of noise whether it is high frequency or etc you can null it you can notch off certain portions if not you have if it is white noise you have to leave with it there's nothing nothing much you can do and usually people uh, do this with uh, speech enhancement techniques right when you have to enhance the speech uh, you treat uh, signal plus noise and you basically do a subtraction on the uh, on the on the correlated noise you decorrelate the noise do a spectral subtraction of that noise if you know these certain properties of the spectrum and then and then what you have is your residual signal capstrom techniques i would i would advise you to look into closely into capstrom techniques or homomorphic deconvolution some of these ideas Okay. So uh, I have an extra question on this. So mm -hmm. we actually model the speech signal as uh, uh, a linear feedback uh, model, right? Uh, uh, no, it's basically random noise through a linear you know, feedback in our model. Yeah. yeah, so linear feedback model. So that's right. how we model. So now if we, uh, so we have studied uh, in our earlier courses on this signal modeling. Mm -hmm. So if we are able to model that as uh, some linear feedback model, does that somehow uh, handle the noise also present in the speech? Um, you know, noise is going to be get modulated. That's the whole idea. Because if you think about a signal flow graph, so every portion of, imagine a cascade of filters uh, in, in the signal flow graph. And each cascaded filter is basically like, a, it vibrates to a phonetic, uh, this thing. Uh, you know, there is a, a certain frequency. Uh, the formant frequency etc right so this 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 reverberates to those frequencies so it's white noise said being sent through a sequence of resonators and to sequence of res resonators you can construct the speech signal as such and that's the whole idea so if you are thinking about cancellation of noise that means i know the properties of speech in a certain way and i want to cancel you can think about the, these these models as well wherein you can say that another signal is coming from this particular way and i want to cancel it if you know exactly what the signal is uh, exact speech utterances that is one way so suppose i know hello and i know hello plus noise if i can model hello using acoustic filters so that is s hat of them this is a, that is my desired signal so i can use an adaptive filter to basically cancel out i know what my desired signal is i know what my input is with noise so i can come up with an adaptive filter which can basically so i am using another form of modeling signal modeling and then being able to cancel it out from there. So I, I hope this answers your question. OK. Uh, so Rohit asks about uh, decimation, how decimation is not invertible. How decimation is not invertible. Um, Rohit, I mean, you if down sample, right? We discussed that you know we, you can reconstruct the signal from decimation provided you know it satisfies pi by m if, if you're an m4 decimator as long as you are able to uh, reconstruct from the decimated samples it's fine as long as your sampling rate is as much as that but in general it is not but you see you simply take a signal and you down sample you cannot invert it because you've lost the interim samples to reconstruct it you'll have to have an interpolation filter that and that is possible provided you are within the sampling constraints sampling rate constraint otherwise you cannot so i said no just a brief clarification on the sampling uh, earlier question so okay so the next question is again by rohit mm -hmm. uh, he asks why can uh, why we can't say periodic impulse train as power signal i don't that get that question what do you mean by it's a power signal yeah i think we'll revisit uh, we'll ask the clarification so meanwhile uh, Satya Prakash has asked, uh, mm -hmm. can orthogonal EMD and uh, ensemble EMD techniques be implemented simultaneously? What is EMD? Can you explain this out for us? Yes. Yeah. Empirical mode decomposition. Empirical mode decomposition. I am not sure I am comfortable. I, I, I have seen these techniques. EMD, I think there's something technical here. <clears throat> Unless you specify mathematically, what it is, maybe I can think through it. Orthogonal EMD ensemble, where do you see this? Absolute, I don't know where he got his clarification. Just uh, empirical mode decomposition. Uh, I don't know what mean by that so 
So on such a profession, it's an adaptive technique based on Hilbert transform. Okay, it could be. I have no idea. Maybe we'll we'll take this question and we'll we'll get back to you offline. Adaptive technique based on Hilbert. Where I mean, adaptive technique. Where is this Hilbert trans transform residing? What is the configuration of the system like? Uh, I think I need more details because I, I'm I'm not active in this area. So. Hilbert transformation is fine, but you know what? What do you do with that? Rohit says um, all periodic signals are power signals, okay. except periodic impulse train. So power signals in the sense, uh, if you take uh, average over a window, mm -hmm. it is like uh, if you take the energy, it is infinite in energy, but uh, uh, over a window. Oh, if you take it over uh, periodic signals, or yeah, I think probably basically you are averaging it over a window, and then uh, you you let that, and therefore it's, it's a periodic impulse strain, right? So uh, his question is why is uh, why we can't say periodic impulse strain. As a power signal. So periodic impulse strain, periodic the, the impulse strain is periodic. Um, periodic. What do you mean periodic impulse strain? I mean is basically you have sequence of impulses, and uh, you say these these sequence of impulses over a window is is periodic. Is it what you what you mean? Why impulse train is not periodic? Not power signal. No, impulse train is just a train of impulses, right? I mean, that need not be periodic. A train of impulses need not be periodic, right? Unless you bring in a discrete time signal like this, and then I can have a periodic periodicity here, right? Trivially, the period is two. Is this what you're saying? I mean, this is a is an impulse train and it is periodic with period two and of course if you look at the energy of the signal is basically infinite right because you add if, if it is going on till infinity this is basically let us say this amplitude is one this is half this is one plus one plus one infinite times is infinity plus half i mean this is square let us say half square plus half square so it is also heads to infinity, right? So therefore, you can't say anything about it. So therefore, this is not, this is an energy. The energy is infinity. So therefore, if you just look at a window of two samples, window about its period, then you can say it's a power signal because it is one square plus one half square, which is finite. I hope this, this explains your question. So uh, maybe his question is also on uh, continuous time signals, saying uh, if you look at uh, periodic impulse, mm -hmm. uh, whether it is a power signal or an energy signal. But I think it it should be a power signal. Uh, and say that again, uh, continuous time signal. So a continuous time signal. Let's mm -hmm. say if we have a sine uh, mm -hmm. wave, right? So it has a finite energy, uh, equal energy in each period. Right, but the energy it has is infinity. If you, if you integrate ah, so it over the, time, uh, over time it is infinity. Infinity, but, but if uh, you, over a period it is going. If to you did this one over t um, energy of the signal on this interval t, I think this is basically a power signal. And if you want to be careful, you might just let this limit t go into infinity. You could do that, right? So this gives you power. I should put the other equation other way around. Power equals this, right? So this basically will give you a finite power, but the energy is infinity because the you know the energy it it, it has is infinity. So so what I think is as Rohit mentions here, uh, uh, amplitude is infinite for impulse. So essentially, I think he is talking about a continuous time signal. Ah, I mean amplitude is infinity, but you have to integrate when you the but the delta Dirac function satisfy a property that you integrate. Over that, that that integral is going to be one, right? 
you have to add that extra condition so it should be a power signal continuous yeah i think that's right uh, so i think it should be a power signal maybe a few side sources where uh, they talk that it is not power signal maybe we we'll look into it and clarify it a little bit yeah uh okay great any other questions so i have a simple question for all of you uh, how many of you are submitting your homeworks those that are viewers here 23 of you 23 viewers are all of you submitting your homeworks regularly It's very important that you solve all your assignments and be prepared uh, for the exam. Yeah, one last. Okay, sure. Please go. Ahead. Please go ahead. Rohit has a question. I think apparently so. Okay. We have one. Uh, what happens if Rohit asks? What happens uh, if Hilbert transform is applied to get back the signal back? Yes. So, so what 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 is hap what happens if the Hilbert transform is applied two times on the same signal? You get the original signal back. It's basically phase inverter. It it basically shifts a phase a phase shifter. Hilbert transform is basically a phase shift. You two two times phase shifting to get back the original thing back. So, uh, so Shiv Kumar is asking about that uh, vibrational analysis of rotating elements. Mm. So this we have discussed a little earlier. Earlier we have talked about. So uh, Shiv Kumar, maybe you can uh, view. The, we will post this video offline once uh, this session is over. So uh, Professor has mentioned. Uh, Uh, I mean, discussed these things earlier. Probably you didn't join the uh, session by then, so you can watch it uh, once a video is made available. Okay. So Sita, Sita again asks, where is analog signal processing used compared to I mean, digital signal processing? Analog everywhere. Before you do signal detection, uh, normally timing can be done in analog. Equalization in a, in in most communication systems. uh once the you have the analog signal um the first thing that you have to do is analog filtering i mean some sort of uh, noise um, removal out of band noise removal etc you may use continuous time filters etc so there you may do analog all it is analog processing essentially any shaping of the spectrum etc just before you have to uh, sample and from there you do equalization uh, sorry you do timing recovery equalization etc so just before that you do all analog signal processing and it, mainly it is filtering these days but if equalization is also wanting that, that it's comfortable that you can do it in analog you can do you can have analog equalizers as well but often now nowadays uh, equalization is done digitally so in most uh, i think um, to just filtering i i would say filtering is restricted to analog signal processing shaping the spectrum etc and post that everything uh, happens to discrete time signal processing so some of these uh, let's say if we have antennas uh, where we receive the signal so mm -hmm. for example we use some kind of match filters right, right. yeah so those uh, would be yeah those would be ideal yeah. for for analog and log and log implementation yes
perhaps my class Sandil Kumar Swaminathan these are some applications of graph signal processing and this is a new area i mean i myself have not gone into do i deal with lot of graphs in other uh, problems particularly in coding theory etc um i can think about you know i i mean i don't know much to comment about at this stage but um um i can think about the large scale networks because basically if you think about signal processing over nodes or edges basically you can think about uh, if you have a massive network a graph is basically having set of vertices and edges and uh, some uh, some flow information so you can think about signals going through these edges in some way or the other right and if you think about signal processing i mean some kind of um, shaping or filtering or any of these things across uh, the edges of the graph one can think about applications Uh, of one can think about graph signal processing techniques in a much broader scale but i think um it's a scenario to be discussed but i think i can give you I, i can sort of give you a motivation with an example imagine you have a network of nodes um, there are edges connecting all these nodes and you have signals going through these edges and any kind of signal processing filtering uh, you know uh, you know filtering uh, of messages um across these um, these edges or information signal signal information to uh, to ascertain what kind of information that you want to relay uh, via signal processing control signal processing through these edges i think you can think of think about applications of graphs in this context so i hope i have given you an a picture brief picture about this but this is a separate area in its own and it is i think a new hot area in signal processing so because people in signal area signal processing have not looked into graphs mainly graphs have been used in coding theory information theory and, and these other areas um, uh, mainly for information transfer uh, or may basically from sources to a sink information transfer from sources to a sink and uh, in the context of signal processing one can think about uh, application of these ideas so i think this is uh, this is my perspective about graph signal processing but i am sure there is a more um, mature uh, information about this uh, this topic so maybe we will cover it as mathematical methods and techniques in signal processing uh, part 3 of the course so so uh, sachi prakash has a question extending sita's question mm-hmm. uh, so sachi prakash asks what is the advantage of keeping filter uh, filtering analog advantage of analog filter um, so a good very good question i think uh, if you think about exponentiation logarithmic uh, transformations etc some of them can be possibly much easily done uh, in the analog uh, side than in the digital side right because if i have to do a logarithmic transformation on a signal maybe i use log amplifiers etc using op amps that naturally work in these exponential logarithmic regions to do the analog um, uh, signal to i mean to do the analog computation right so if you were to do it in digital you have to think about um you know newton's method to approximate these functions have them in a huge lookup table if you want the required precision and then process it so therefore there are certain advantages directly to process it in analog because it computation naturally happens in analog another good example uh, is for example if you think about optical signal processing if you have two lenses which are kept uh, you know for f apart you get the same signal back that is it's basically a fourier transform uh, 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 it does a fourier transform and you replicate at the same distance uh, at two f apart you get another fourier transform so you can get back the original signal back so a lot of these devices whether it's optical which can it is again analog you can get a lot of transformations done and naturally you can think about implementing log or exponential or some of these computations very naturally in analog which otherwise would have to have lookup tables and some mathematical operations to do that so i think that's the advantage of doing in analog okay hope it answers your question uh, so satya has one more question mm. while adaptive wavelet filters are digital filters okay while adaptive what is this probably uh, as a part of this question on the analog or uh, why adaptive filter? why is it why or why i don't understand so maybe yes. it is why adaptive filter satya satya prakash is it why adapt why adaptive 
filter wavelet filters or digital filters or while i don't i don't see your question uh, while or why but uh, wavelet filters i mean these should be convenient uh, in uh, implementing in digital domain right right because they involve a lot of uh, uh, mathematical operations which right. are more convenient to be implemented on a digital signal process yes yes so these are uh, yes as long as the order is tractable that's it right. yes so uh, yeah why so it is part of the first question so what is this uh, so uh, why do we use analog filters what is the advantage of keeping analog filters while adaptive filters are digital filters oh yeah i, I answered your question then uh, so essentially it depends on the application in this place mainly for computation yeah and uh, the other thing is wavelets is more mathematical in nature no you could still have analog filters which are mathematical in nature right? okay you could you could still have sophisticated your lagger filters your uh, your um, your lagger filter I means you could have analog continuous time filters for all, for all of these but um, i think the question of digital versus analog really depends upon if you want to store something and then process and do something else at your pace easily then you may need those digital filters because it gives you a lot of flexibility but sometimes analog computations like exponential log r make even sometimes realizing some sophisticated operations are possible much easier with analog than with digital so if that is a case and where your uh, noise bandwidth is with within tractable limits you can go with analog filters than with digital filters so i think those are the that's how i would just feel the the choice between analog and digital Russell Verma. So Russell Verma has a question. Uh, how initial condition affects the impulse response of mechanical systems? Example, uh, uh, airplanes or aircrafts. I think. Ailerons of Ailerons. aircraft. What is this aileron? Uh, is it something new to us uh, in aircrafts? Uh, how initial condition affects the impulse? Yeah, this is a good question. See, the initial condition really, if you think about system behavior, right? It is a natural response of the system. so that is given by the impulse response so i give you an impulse to a system and i have an output this is an impulse right this is an impulse there is a natural response to the system right and if the impulse if i give you any other uh, initial conditions then the system behavior can be different right it can uh, because there is a forcing function than the impulse so depending upon the initial conditions you may not get the natural response of the system you may get it may be unstable depending upon your initial conditions or it might be a stable which might go to zero you de that depends upon the initial conditions right so this is uh, a basic uh, a basic theory here so Okay, aircraft, air cart control system. Aircraft control system. So ailerons are like. Okay. Some. So ailerons, so you know, you have a. Um, so they are like control system. Ah, basically, to on the wings, you have a left force, you have a right force, you have a, you know, ah, it's a good question. So basically, it's very important because the initial conditions have to be maintained. If the because the, the output of the system. can become depending upon if the system for example is critically so that it is that it depends on natural uh, vibrations in the the modes of the system right so if the system modes are linear i mean sorry or uh, stable right then you can expect that the impulse response of the system is basically um, is is stable it's bevo stable so if the poles of the system are because they they get perturbed and and if this if the, if the modes are unstable then any other input in input can give you a blown up output so therefore uh, it really depends upon the so the output depends upon both the input transfer function and the the filter the, which is the system behavior system modes system modes can be uh, stable but the input itself if, if the model for the input itself is unstable for whatever reason that can cause basically bonkers on your aircraft so so it is also possible that that initial condition can uh, trigger the modes of the system and yes. cause the vibration absolutely. yes absolutely okay. because if you are resonating on something else it can amplify completely so
okay okay I think varsh Russell Verma, he, he had he had his uh, question answered. So we don't know what your actual names are. So we just see your Google IDs here. So I don't know if it's Russian, like if I pronounced your first name right, Russian or Russian or. Do we have any more questions? So you can ask any question. I mean, related to the assignments. If you find assignments are hard, you can you can discuss this here now. If you you know you can feel completely free to, uh, or if you find any question was interesting that you would like to share with, it's great. If you find if you found some question was difficult and it lacked, you can also TS can help you out to resolve uh, that part of understanding. So uh, feel completely free to ask questions. So I have one question. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have uh, studied some of uh, uh, these concepts of uh, linear spaces and uh, hmm. extended due to signal modeling. Right. So we have seen that we can construct some basic signals of our own choice to represent. Uh, Hmm. signals as, as uh, points in a uh, right. linear space. So do we see any practical applications in, uh, I mean, using these methods? Oh yeah, for communication systems. Hmm. I think you can think about these constellations and all these things, right? Uh, QAM, PSQ. Uh, so QAM, uh, so these are all like uh, very standard uh, basic signals, the sine right. omega t right. and cos omega t. Right. However, uh, is uh, are there applications where we design our own basic signals and use them? So which are non-standard or... Uh, we could do that. The Gram-Schmidt essentially does let us do that, right? Correct. I mean, if you know the geometry of the signals that you're dealing with, you can design the base, best basis under the representation. I know these... I have M signals. Out of M signals, maybe uh, N, which is less than M, form the basis for these signals. And if I know the nature of my signals, using Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization procedure, I can come up with the basis that I want. Uh, so uh, do we see any practical application in or a need to design such basic signals? Yeah, because it's the best in terms of the approximation, uh, right? So do we, we have any practical it? application? So one I probably have heard is the, some of these compressive sensing techniques. Okay, they, they make use of... Uh, uh, so one is, yeah, they can project to an appropriate basis and mm -hmm. uh, might uh, represent a signal within a lower dimension. So instead of... Yeah. So uh, are there any other, because uh, what I feel is designing uh, some of this basic signal online, uh, live when... Uh, that's a difficult thing, that's, that's a difficult, difficult part. I mean, yeah, the best basis pursuit, etc. right? Correct. So uh, I think, but it gives you the freedom, the flexibility. I mean, either if you, if you know a priori what kind of signals are, then you can do this basis pursuit, whichever you think is, is ideal. And from there, you can basically represent the signal with the best representation, that is the least in terms of your Euclidean norm, right? You can go about with that. So I think it's it's just a design of choice, essentially. So, so Sachi Prakash has another question. He says, uh, he asks, if a signal of very small magnitude, say in nano amperes, and uh, is polluted with higher order noises, how to okay. filter the noise? Uh, I mean, we are talking about the signal to noise ratio here. And if the noise overrides the signal, you are uh, basically negative decibel in, in terms in terms of SNR, right? Ten locked based in uh, the SNR signal to noise ratio that you get is negative. I think that would, unless you can do unless there is a very <coughs> typical signature for your signal that you know that is very narrow uh, on on these particular frequencies, then you can basically enhance it and pull pull the noise out of it. Otherwise, it is not. If you are really a negative SNR. You you really are doing it, you know, zero dB. You, in the information you are conveying is really zero in, in such a case. So therefore, you cannot. I mean, that depends upon the noise floor. But yeah, but if you know that there is some other properties for the signal, and then you can, you know, you also know the properties of the noise, then you can still, you can try and fight out to get the clean signal. 
I think if you think about uh, most of these Bose acoustic cancellers, right, they do these type of techniques because they actually work with the property of the, yeah. Can you do FFT for long period to get original signal if signal is very weak? Uh, no, I just, you know, it's buried, right? What can you do? I mean, if it is, if, if, you, if your signal and noise has the same properties, like for example, I can give you an example of babbled noise, right? You're in a cocktail party, the speech is somebody is talking to you. At the same time, there's a mixture of several other talks by other people that is basically noise and whose spectrum results like um, speech and you add the two together and if you want to separate out, it's very hard. So there are blind source, uh, you know, this is this are problems with blind source separation. I read one paper with, which is for getting gravitational waves. Uh, you can please share that paper with us. We don't know so exactly. I, uh, uh, one way to uh, remove noise is basically make repeated measurements and uh, yeah, you average, just average them, them. You just average them out. That's just a normal technique. Basically, Correct. you're just doing averaging, but that may not be just sufficient. So a lot of this astronomical uh, mm -hmm. data that they collect, it is like they collect uh, over, uh, I mean, many samples over time and then average it out right. uh, to cancel out the noise. Yeah, averaging is basically like a low-pass filtering. So basically, you're removing the out-of-band noise by averaging. That might be one of the... Uh, it it uh, is, one uh, is that and the noise is zero mean. So yes, once yes. you average out multiple noise samples, yeah, noise, should, noise should go out if it is zero mean. But if it is not, then... Yes. So for which you have to col collect a lot of ensembles of that Correct. data, different time measurements, and then align the phases together, and then you have to basically think about it. Yeah. So we have time till 6 15 right because we oh, started so we can late. continue for another, another 10 minutes. minutes okay Yeah, feel free to ask questions. We have 10 more minutes. Can you throw some light on gravitational wave signal identification? Uh, it's something out of my domain, but I can certainly take this question offline, and uh, you know, I can, I can, I can respond back to you via email. Is that fine? So basically, can Rohit, can you share your question via email to the TAs? I can dig up a little bit of literature on gravitational waves, and I can. You know, I can explain. I mean, if you have very specific questions, I can answer those. Yeah. So uh, essentially, gravitational wave identification. So uh, what matters from the systems that we are dealing with is only the sensor, right? right. So the sensor should be specifically tuned to uh, detect mm. the changes in gravitational fields. Right. Uh, for the but I don't know what this wave is, what your properties uh, are. I, I, I have so no idea. The single what... processing deals with the properties of those. Yes. Waves. Yes. Okay. Uh, Rohit has one more question. Uh, Rohit, we have just answered. Uh, Sachi Prakash has a question. Uh, 
what is the di real difference between wavelet transform and, and empirical wavelet transform well i mean wavelet transform is the same thing right what is empirical in this empirical is something which is done through simulation studies or something empirical wavelet transform i don't know what you mean by empirical this is, this is something new to be continuous or discrete is what is uh, are the salient uh, uh, i mean salient terms in wavelet transformation i don't know what you mean by empirical so empirical is something decompose a signal or an image on so wavelet tight frame which are adaptively built yeah i think that is basically on the fly so on the fly in the sense uh, we construct the wavelet signals based yeah. on the signal uh, signal yeah signals that we absorb so it is not any standard not any standard form but on the fly you build so i think that might be what empirical means okay so shivakumar uh, how to acquire vibrational data from vehicle drive shaft to predict a crack how to acquire vibration data from vehicle drive so you can place a sensor on your shaft right and as it is going through basically as it is uh, as as the wheel is going through uh, as rotatory wheel is going through it it can basically you can record the signature as as so basically you can record an elect as the as the uh, as there is a movement basically there's a torque and from this rotatory movement you can place a sensor on the on, on a portion of the rotating wheel and as your wheel is going through you can sense a signal that is conveyed through the rotation and therefore you can acquire that data and uh, then where there is a discrepancy where there is a crack you can you know basically it, it shows a dip down or whatever from that you can basically unfurl the uh, so, uh, failure analysis uh, maybe the question is also on uh, we will not be able to keep a sensor on the uh, uh, drive shaft because uh, it you is could rotating. Even, you could also have an optical Huh. sensor right optical basically you can just put an optical sensor just you may not, you may not place it to or on the wheel but you may have an optical sensor which senses a signal correct and then you you can place a pointer where you know because it's like the ideal circle you should have some point where you started off and then as it is translating as it is rotating it it is is a linear translation correct. the displacement right and you can just basically get that signal through the optical sensor and then you can basically do the failure analysis to get the crack So uh, Nishant has uh... or digital frequencies, or this is just for two pi. Two pi is your uh, sampling, and pi is your uh, Nyquist. Nyquist rate half. So what is the significance? So what is the significance of digital frequency? Essentially, we uh, remove the idea of sampling rate in yeah, the digital frequency because there is uh, basically so, when you discrete time, it's just a sequence of numbers. It is a sequence uh, labeled as one, two, three. In That's the all. Sequence of numbers. You don't have any unit to the numbers. that side about digital frequency because you, you don't we don't have a concept of a meter or a, a time temperature kelvin or time or whatever there's just the notion of sequence of numbers that's all and that's the idea and uh, nishant has another question on what does negative frequency signify signify i mean uh, this is a standard thing people ask right in uh, two negative basically e power g omega t e power minus g omega t add them by two that is giving you a cosine signal basically and basically this is a standing wave a standing wave can be thought about as two different phasors acting in in, in opposite directions clockwise and anti clockwise and you need that to represent the standing wave and each of the standing wave basically is this, if you think about it in system mode there are two modes in this cosine signal one is a phasor in this direction other is other in the other direction and that basically is giving you a standing wave and that is basically a resonator uh, and that you can say is your uh, meaning of a negative frequency that you so the other way we can think of is uh, when you have a uh, cauchy frequency you can say that the phase is going in clockwise direction yes negative otherwise frequency is a phase clockwise exactly. just a phase orse that's all so rohit said he'll share the paper on gravitational waves yeah please share the paper and if you have any questions you can just ask so another question is um, yeah nishant i think we answered his question now yes so Yeah, I think we have answered the questions so far. Yeah, we just have about three, four minutes, I guess. Nilesh's question. Hmm. Nilesh. Okay. Where is it? Oh, we can't see it. We can't see it here. Can you? If you want, you can read it out. I want to know. is there any difference between dpft and dft 
okay. what is the difference D between D DTFT is discrete time Fourier transform, right? The 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 frequency the, the, the frequency response is uh, continuous, but time is discrete. In DFT, both time and frequency are discrete. That's all. So Rohit has one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, if a signal is chosen at random among a discrete set of signals, okay, and then it's observed in, mm -hmm. in additive noise, how can the uh, chosen signal be dis uh, discriminated? I mean, you can do maximum likelihood detection on this. So well. uh, yeah, we have one uh, uh, problem solving session on this. Okay. So you just figure out the likelihood of the signal over the rest of the signals under this noise, and then you can figure out which is which is what the one with the least distance metric or maximum in terms of likelihood i mean i'm not least i mean i'm talking about minimization over the euclidean norm if it is gaussian noise in general the noise need not be gaussian right then you can just construct a likelihood function and then do maximum likelihood detection on this to get the right label out i think one of the problem huh. sets i don't remember which one of these but yes i think we just the... look at look into one of the problem solving sessions in the course and i think uh, the ts have discussed NML detection idea. So yeah, it is in week four content. So the last lecture was okay. Week four, uh, Rohit, I advise you to look into week four lectures and where there are problem solving sessions related to the same question that you have asked. Yeah, week three and week four problem solving. Okay, three and four. Nilesh Bishwas, sir, I have another question. Yeah, another question. What are the practical applications of multi-rate systems? Oh, plenty. I mean, trans multiplexers, uh, your uh, your multimedia coders, right? I mean, the JPEG, JPEG 4, I mean, MPEG 4 and beyond uses wavelet transformation, which is basically subband coding. Then, uh, many, plenty, plenty of applications. And wherever you require a sampling rate conversion, where you don't want to convert it into an analog signal and then again sample back, you use uh, multi rate signal processing uh, ideas. And also for high decimation filters, because if it, with, with the decimation filters, you can with lower orders you can get done uh, with um, with the filtering, right? I mean, and than uh, otherwise, so plenty of applications. So I advise you to look into the uh, uh, chapter four from Vaidhinathan. Chapter four, chapters four and five. There's an entire treatment on applications. Uh, there, I think uh, section, if I recall, four point five and about. Uh, check into those details and you will have plenty of applications. But I gave you already three, four applications. Trans multiply, uh, plan, trans multiplexers, that is uh, uh, TDM to FDM systems. Then um, we also, for subband coding for multi multimedia uh, coders, that is for um, uh, compression. Um, and then sampling rate conversion without having to convert it back into analog signal and then resample. And all these applications require multi rate signal processing. So it's now a universal uh, tool. So. Wherever you are. Um, and also feel free to uh, share your comments on the YouTube videos. And uh, I think it would be very nice for us to get feedback. So I think uh, as you see, read through the videos, uh, mark your comment and mark your likes as well. It's good for us. And any questions, feel absolutely free to mail the TAs and, and uh, they'll, they'll pass these questions on to me. Okay. We can wind this up. Yes. Yeah. So we'll wind this up and uh, we'll take this as a feedback. If you think these sessions are useful, We'll have these once in a week now, or till once in a week, or once in ten days. 
throughout I mean, we will we will decide the frequency depending upon your uh, interest and response and have these uh, an appropriate time so that uh, your questions can be answered way well before your final exams okay and as i uh, would like to conclude i would like to uh, remind you to write your comments on the youtube videos your likes etc and uh, be proactive in asking questions uh, to the TAs. I can't hear your voice, but certainly I can see your questions, and I can, uh, you know, that's that's the feedback that I have here. Okay, so good luck, all of you, and have a nice day.